Well, divisions on the Conservative benches mirroring those on the Labour side of the House. So might a reshuffle be on the cards? Let's get the view from the Conservative backbenchers with the Conservative MP for Litchfield, Sir Michael Fabricant. Um, Boridar, Michael. Boridar Vaughan. Um, Backer? Saka? Where do you stand? Backer. Um, I think that uh, there is going to be a a reshuffle. Uh, It's long overdue, actually. I hope she stays in place. I mean, it's important that uh, if the Supreme Court gives the authority for the Rwanda policy to go ahead, that she sees it through. Um, You know, like Jeremy Hunt, I wouldn't have used quite the same language as her, but I certainly agree with her sentiment. I mean, for example, if you remember earlier in the week, she had said, that uh, homeless people have a lifestyle choice. Now, I don't agree with the it being a lifestyle choice. I think it often has to do with mental illness. Um, and that certainly seems to be the experience of Shelter, the charity who look after these people. Uh, I know that in Litchfield, the uh, constituency I represent, we uh, occasionally have a homeless person here. And um, although he's been offered accommodation, he chooses to sleep in the street. But sort of generalising, I think he's never wise. But, uh, I mean, it's interesting, though, that that, that you bring up that because because this is you know if it is an offence then the Home Secretary is a serial offender isn't she in terms of saying things that distract uh, essentially from the government's agenda you know we had the King's speech this was meant to be a relaunch meant to be a restart and yet here we are we're talking about the Home Secretary again. Well, I agree with you, Vaughan, and I hasten to add, I am a supporter of Suella, but I do agree with you. It can be very frustrating for Downing Street. Um, Tony Blair brought in this idea of the grid, and parties and prime ministers ever since have actually followed the grid with great enthusiasm. The grid being the planned... uh, releases, if you like, or stories that they're hoping that the press and television, radio media are going to cover during the course of the next two weeks. And uh, when the grid is upset by an unexpected event, like Suella's announcements, then uh, it, you know, it does manage to upset the Prime Minister and uh, people in the uh, in Temp Number 10 uh, quite a the, lot. And well, we're in the run-up to a general election, aren't we? You know, um, and the clock is ticking, the polls aren't looking very good, um, um, the last thing you need is is a Home Secretary going rogue. Well, we do need to have a little bit more self-discipline, I agree, just like in the Labour Party too. But, you know, I like to see a Home Secretary who has some passion and who has conservative principles. And, you know, I think that a lot of what she has said, maybe not the way she said it, but certainly what she said in principle is shared by very many people. By uh, the way, just... If, oh, sorry, if you, just yeah, no, 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 I just want to ask you this, though. Uh, hmm. You know, the things that, that she said specifically about the march, you know, that there was a police bias against the right wing and, and so on compared to the, to the left. Well, we saw the reason, didn't we, why the police might treat the far right differently from the left, because we had a march... 300,000 people according to the police, 800,000 according to the organisers, that was largely peaceful, uh, staged by the pro-Palestinian or pro-peace faction. Yeah, there were people wearing Hamas headbands and some people climbed on a war memorial, but it was largely peaceful. The Prime Minister said as much. And then we had these small mobs um, of hooligans, I think it's fair to call them, you know, who were dressing themselves up in, in, in the Union Jack, shouting at the police, you're not English anymore, all this stuff. You know, the police would have, have a, be making a fair judgment if they said those people were more problematic than the sort of people on the Palestinian march. Well, certainly as a percentage, they were more problematic. They're just jobs weren't they? But, you know, let's be re- remember as well that people on that march, first of all, uh, a minority of them, but nevertheless a substantial minority of them, uh, were occupying and intimidating people at railway stations. Michael Gove got jobbed, uh, got mobbed rather, when he was trying to get down to his constituency at Victoria Station. You had Jewish people, I know, who have been uh, intimidated and insulted on tube trains. Uh, uh, you know, this is not law and order in this country, and there does need to be an even-handedness. And if you read the article that was written by Suella Braverman and published in The Times, um, apart from a one or two phrases, which I think people took exception to, uh, she just pointed out that there does need to be... Uh, 
you know, an even handedness. And sometimes there isn't an even handedness. By the way, can I just say mm. something? I, I was listening to the interview you had with uh, that lovely uh, Labour MP and she's uh, a very Winter. nice person. Mm, she's a very nice person. You know, I just want to remind her that Hamas in Gaza have said that they will do similar attacks again and again and again. They've actually said this uh, on Israel, as which happened on October the 7th, where they butchered children and tortured uh, civilians. Mm. You know, Israel has got to do something. Now, maybe they're too heavy handed. Maybe they're not. Military experts will say, but Israeli soldiers don't want to be getting killed in the, in the tunnels which mm. operate underneath Gaza, including underneath hospitals. Uh, yeah, to so be f- it's to- a very, very difficult thing. And as your friend said to you, well, what is Israel expected to do? It's their job to defend their citizens. Uh, I mean, sure, Mike, you know, there, uh, this is incredibly difficult. And, you know, as Rina Piorworth was say, s- saying earlier, you know, the um, what, what, what Hamas did in, in Gaza um, uh, in Israel was, was absolutely appalling. You know, um, th- there's stuff out there that I can't bring myself to look at, but which I've, I've heard about, you know. But so- somehow there has to be an end brought to this. Um, you know, there always has to be an end, even if it's only a pause, even if it's only a ceasefire. It can't go on forever. Well, there certainly needs to be pauses. And in fact, the Israelis are now doing this. So they're having four hour pauses each day to allow um, food supplies to come in. I mean, you've got to bear in mind as well that Egypt has closed the border because uh, they don't want Gazans flooding into Egypt and destabilizing the country. Um, the problem is, you know, it, the decision was made, oh gosh, was it 14, 15 years ago to allow Gaza to get on with it? I mean, people talk about free. Palestine, Gaza has been free. And and look what's happened as a consequence. I remember one Israeli guy, uh, not, not in the government, saying to me, you know what they should do, Mike? They should do what the uh, Native Americans do on their reservations in America. They open casinos, they open uh, other entertainment things, and they're rolling in money. Now, I'm not saying that's what they should do in Gaza, but, you know, they could have made Gaza into, they've got fantastic beaches there. They could have made it into an amazing city. And, you know, it's not all uh, run-down shantytowns like in parts of South Africa. Uh, Parts of Gaza are very, very pleasant indeed. Maybe not now, sadly, but certainly was before October 7th. Michael Fabrican, thank you very much uh, indeed uh, for talking to us this morning.